And welcome to another Hank Unplugged podcast. We are committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds, and today will be no exception. I've spent the last couple of weeks immersed in the writings of Dr. Richard Weikart. I'm going to introduce him in just a moment, but as prologue to this podcast, I want to mention that anyone who's spent even a modicum of time looking at the progression of scientific speculation knows full well that academics are not impervious to groupthink. And that is particularly true when it comes to tenure, social dynamics, grants, and the like. But we would be hard-pressed to come up with a better example of herd mentality than the collective embrace of eugenics. The moniker eugenics, or what's known as the science of being well-born, was coined way back in 1865 by Sir Francis Galton. If you don't know about him, he was a prestigious polymath. He was a sociologist. He was a psychologist, an anthropologist. He was also cousin to Charles Darwin. And Darwin actually followed suit. In The Descent of Man, he made explicit that his notorious subtitle, The Preservation of Favored Races and the Struggle for Life, quite rightly applied to human races. Apart from eugenics, according to Darwin, there is nothing to prevent the reckless, the otherwise inferior members of society from increasing at a quicker rate than the better class of men. Well, groupthink, and that's the point I'm trying to make right here, is groupthink followed on the heels of Galton and Darwin. And so with the dawn of the 20th century, Eugenics became standard fare in high school biology textbooks. I think off the top of my head right now of George William Hunter's textbook. We all know about it. It was titled A Civic Biology. And I, like most other Americans, remember it because it was the infamous biology text at the center of the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. And of course, this text made a stirring case for the pseudoscience of eugenics. And all of this has been breathlessly touted by the evolutionary establishment as evolvement. In reality, it represents a throwback to 19th century scientists who hypothesized that the gene pool was being corrupted by the less fit genes of inferior people. And we want to talk about all of that today because my guest is a historian who ably notes what happened in the last century. But he also has ably made parallels to what is happening in our century. My guest today is Dr. Richard Weikert. He's an emeritus professor of history at California State University, and he's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. He's an author. He's written many books, including From Darwin to Hitler. And one of my favorites, a book that I have to confess I'm only halfway through right now, it's titled The Death of Humanity. In addition to his many books, he has published articles in scholarly journals, including articles for our own flagship magazine, The Christian Research Journal. His most recent book is Darwinian Racism, How Darwinism Influenced Hitler, Nazism, and White Nationalism. It is great to have you on Hank Unplugged. I've listened to some of your interviews and find you to be a direct fit for our mission statement. You're interesting, you're informative, you're inspirational. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to be with you. 
Well, let's start out with an obvious question, perhaps, and that is, looking at Darwinian racism, your book, was Darwin a racist? Yeah, there's actually not too much debate about this among historians who look at this issue, because Darwin clearly taught in the descent of man He doesn't say much about humans, by the way, in The Origin of Species. And some people say, well, he didn't really talk about humans there. But, well, 12 years later, he published The Origin of Species in 1859. But in 1871, he published The Descent of Man, where he made very clear his views about race as well as other things. And he made very clear that he not only believed in the differences in the mental abilities and even moral capacities of different races, but perhaps even more strikingly, He believed that these races were in competition in the struggle for existence, and that because of that, some of the races that he considered superior, and of course he thought the Europeans were superior, uh, were going to exterminate those who were considered inferior. And so something has to be done about that, and that's why in the prologue they brought up the word eugenics, and I really want to focus on that for a few moments. Eugenics was not only something that was proliferating in Nazi Germany, but it was proliferating throughout the United States of America. I mean, you have some of the most prestigious minds from presidents to, well, Margaret Sanger, who's the birth mother of Planned Parenthood, to Carnegie, to Rockefeller, to Stanford. You had all of these prestigious universities and people promoting eugenics. And it wasn't until the ghastly results of eugenics became apparent to all of the Nazi death camps that it quietly vanished into the night. Yeah, exactly. Eugenics was considered scientific mainstream. There were courses on eugenics in American universities. Biology textbooks taught eugenics as really as a matter of course. And it was built upon Darwinian ideology, and then Galton, you mentioned, was a cousin of Darwin, but we don't want to go into the guilt by association, but Galton himself said that he came across the idea of eugenics while reading The Origin of Species, his cousin's book. So it was very intimately connected with Darwinism, and if you look at the ideology of the eugenics proponents in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, they were claiming forthrightly that they were building their eugenics notions on Darwinism, because they thought that humans, by having institutions that help the weak and the poor, had sort of contravened the Darwinian struggle for existence, and that this then was going to allow the weak and the sick to reproduce and to swamp, essentially, the good genes, so-called good genes, of the other people in society. And so they needed to find a way around that, which was eugenics. So eugenics was artificial selection. And by the way, one of the favorite tools of the eugenics movement in the early 20th century was compulsory sterilization. And Nazi Germany was not the first place to do that. Nazi Germany did do that. But the state of Indiana in the United States was the first jurisdiction to pass a compulsory sterilization law. And California passed one two years later, and many states in the United States passed them in the first half of the... In fact, over half the states in the U.S. had compulsory sterilization laws, which were intended to try to improve human heredity. Yeah, it was back in 1907. Amazing that you had the state of Indiana passing the first compulsory sterilization law. And then, as you point out, a lot of other states followed suit. Your title, Darwinian Racism, How Darwinism Influenced Hitler, Nazism, and White Nationalism. I want to get into all of that, but you've pointed out in other venues that this outrage, this outrage of sterilization laws and eugenics, was actually being preached in America in liberal Protestant denominations. Yes. In fact, there's an entire book out by Christine Rosen, a scholar who's looked at that issue. It's called Preaching Eugenics. That's the title of her book. And in that book, she looks at the way that mostly Protestants were preaching, supporting eugenics, and it's overwhelmingly from the liberal Protestant side, which was sort of the mainline denominations in the early 20th century in America. So the liberal Protestants were trying to jump on the bandwagon of anything that was considered scientific at the time. So they embraced Darwinism, they embraced eugenics, uh, they embraced scientific racism, the topic of 
my book, Darwinian Racism. So racism is inherent in Darwin's theory. We are embracing Darwinism in our academic institutions today. And yet, so many people that tout Darwinian evolution are dead set against racism. They're preaching against racism while maybe having some cognitive dissonance, not recognizing that they're buttressing the very edifice that produces racist ideology. Yeah, you know, doing intellectual history is kind of tricky because you're right. People sort of mix and match ideas sometimes, and they don't always fit together. So in this case, the reason why racism was so fundamental for Darwin's theory about human evolution is because Darwin wanted to show that there was as much variation as possible within the human species. And in fact, if you look at his book, Origin of Species, where he doesn't talk about humans to any extent except the last couple pages he mentions them, the first chapter is on variation under domestication, and the second chapter is on variation in nature. So he has to try to show there's as much variation as possible for evolution to get off the ground. So in the human species, when he turns to humans, he uses racism, which was pre-existing, and Darwin did not invent racism. It was a prejudice that he had already growing up and such, but... He was going to integrate it into his theory by claiming that this shows that humans have variation, and it served his purposes to try to show that humans have the widest amount of variation possible. So they considered not just Darwin, but many Darwinists after him, and I do examine some of these in my book, such as Ernst Haeckel, the most famous German Darwinist of the late 19th century, were making claims. Haeckel, for example, was claiming that the lowest humans, which he thought were the Australian Aborigines, he thought were closer to apes in their mental abilities than they were to the Europeans. And this was standard fare. This was not an unusual position for Darwinists to take in that period. So they're trying to show that there's this gradation you know, from the lowest humans, which are close to apes, to the highest humans, which are further away. And so it serves the purpose of their theory to show as wide a variation as possible. Now, in the 20th century, as people began to move away from racism, especially in the intellectual elites in the middle part of the 20th century, they began claiming that, you know, that genetics and such show that there's not as wide a variation between the races. And of course, they started recognizing empirically that a lot of people of other races are highly intelligent and they're not inferior intellectually. And so that sort of creates some cognitive dissonance. So they had to sort of set aside this idea of racism. And thankfully, they set aside the idea, at least most intellectually, to set it aside. However, as I show in my book, there are some people on the white nationalist side who are continuing to promote the idea that Darwinism promotes racism. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little later on in the podcast, but fair to say that Darwin considered racial inequality as evidence for his theory. Yeah, and what's interesting is that after... Okay, so Darwin sees racism as evidence for his theory, and what's interesting is that after Darwin, once Darwinism became established as a sort of scientific consensus by roughly the turn of the century or so, many of Darwinists at that point and in the early 20th century were arguing that Darwinism proves racism. So Darwin thought that racism proved human evolution, and later evolutionists were going to say Darwinism proves racism because there has to be variation in the species for evolution to happen. Darwin also saw genocide. I mean, we're hearing a lot about genocide today with the war in Ukraine. But Darwin saw genocide as a progressive force in human evolution. Exactly. In fact, in The Descent of Man, here's a quotation from The Descent of Man where he's talking about this very issue. And he said, quote, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. And so he thought that was how evolutionary progress was going to happen, by these so-called lower races being exterminated. The higher races survive, and that brings about evolutionary progress. I wonder in this woke environment we live in today, why statues of Darwin aren't being pulled down? Because he not only believed that there were differences in cranial capacities between various human beings, but he also believed in the intellectual inferiority of women. 
exactly. that women were intellectually inferior in whatever they might take up. And I read this myself in The Descent of Man. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting point you raised there, because Darwin, together with other anthropologists of his day, thought that cranial capacities were a way to measure the intellectual abilities. We now know that's not true, but Darwin thought it was, and women do have, on the average, smaller cranial capacities because their bodies are smaller and such. So, But Darwin, you're right, did use that as evidence to claim that women are intellectually inferior as well. As to why the statues aren't toppled, I think that there are just too many people worshiping Darwin. (laughs) You've already sort of touched on this, but I want to expand on this if you would, and that is the subtitle for origin. Can that rightly be applied to humans? There are a lot of woke educational polymaths, people that we're familiar with, names that roll off our tongue, who are saying today that the subtitle the preservation of favored races in the struggle for existence does not apply to human beings. Well, in The Origin of Species, Darwin barely mentions humans. Only in the last couple of pages does he say anything about humans. But in that last couple of pages, he does make clear that he does think his evolutionary theory applies. And if you read Darwin's notebooks, he was already theorizing about human evolution quite extensively before writing The Origin of Species. And then if you turn to The Descent of Man, written 12 years later in 1871, he makes very clear that the things that he laid out in The Origin of Species do apply to humans. So the question is sort of tricky, because was he talking about favored races in origin of species? Does that mean human races in origin of species? Well, mostly he's talking more about like what we think of subspecies of like pigeons and other kinds of things. But you turn to the descent of man, and he clearly is talking about races, and he actually does say that races are subspecies. He doesn't think they're separate species. He claims that there is one human species. Darwin does argue for the unity of the human species. But he argues that there's different subspecies, which he thinks are these races. Now, interestingly, some Darwinists after him, like Ernst Haeckel, were going to argue that different human races are actually completely separate species. And some, there were even a few, not very many, but there actually were a few Darwinists, anthropologists in the late 19th century, uh, who argued that different human races, and here they were thinking particularly about the white Caucasians as one branch, the East Asians as another major branch, and the black Africans as another major branch. They thought that those three branches had actually evolved from different ape species. And so they saw so that much separation and division and variation within the human species. You brought up Heckel a couple of times. You know, he is someone who has really impacted so many of us in different ways. We've all seen his drawings. And I'm surprised that those drawings are still extant. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The emerging embryo goes through all of the evolutionary phases. So at one time it's a fish and later on it becomes a frog and eventually it becomes a fetus. And by the way, that was actually used as an argument for being able to abort early on, because when you're aborting early on, you're aborting a creature as opposed to a child. Right. Yes, uh, Heckel's drawings uh, still, or at least, if not the drawings themselves, at least the ideas you're suggesting is sort of taught as standard fare in many places. And you're right, it was used to justify these kind of positions, that human fetus is closer to animal than it is to a human, sort of buying into the evolutionary deception. And by the way, interestingly, there were anthropologists and psychiatrists and such in the late 19th, early 20th century, they were arguing, too, that people with mental illnesses were closer to apes than they were to humans because they hadn't intellectually developed enough to be like humans. You write a lot about Adolf Hitler, what the Nazis did. Adolf Hitler famously said that only humans, and especially the church, have made it their goal to artificially preserve the weak the unfit for life, and the inferior. And though he made statements like that, there are a lot of people that are arguing that Hitler was actually a Christian, because you can find him advocating for Christianity on the other side. So he was certainly a chameleon. Definitely. In fact, I think I actually use that word, chameleon, in my book, Hitler's Religion, where I talk about Hitler's religious beliefs. 
In my book, Hitler's Religion, I argue that Hitler was a pantheist, that is, he believed that nature was God. He was very slippery, though, you're right. He was a, a consummate politician. It's interesting, if you look at the statements that he made very positively about Christianity, almost all of those were in the early phases of his political career, most of them before he became a chancellor of Germany and dictator, and a couple of them maybe just right after, when he's still trying to woo the German public over to his side. And let me give you one very poignant example that I discovered while I was doing my research on my book, Hitler's Religion. Heinrich Hoffmann, who was Hitler's personal photographer, took a photo of Hitler leaving a church. And in this photo, there's a cross in the background, but it's right over Hitler's head, the way the you know, the way the angle is of the photo that's being taken. It's a real bright white cross standing right on top of Hitler's head, the way the photo was taken. And it looks like, you know, sort of gives Hitler this halo effect, you know, sort of makes him seem like he's saintly or something. And, and here's Hitler coming out of a church. So you think, okay, he got to a church service, and here he is, this bright white cross over his head. And the caption to the photo says something to the effect of Hitler, the supposed heretic, you know, coming out of the Marine Church in Wilhelmshaven. So, interestingly, that was published just before he became chancellor. That was published in 1932 originally. But then several years later, Hoffman published another edition of that book of photographs. And in that next edition that was published several years later, they airbrushed the cross out of the photo. So you don't have the cross over his head, you know, sort of giving him this Christian symbol with him. And the caption, of course, had to change as well. And the caption then read, Hitler sightseeing at the church in (laughs) Wilhelmshaven. So it's changed from you have Hitler having this cross over his head to Hitler, you know, just sightseeing uh, in this church. And that was sort of emblematic. Hitler did want to portray himself as being close to Christianity when he was running up to come to power. But after he was in power and didn't have to worry as much about public opinion quite as much, he wasn't quite as careful to maintain that kind of image. And also, if you look at his private conversations that he had, we have monologues that he held while he was at his headquarters during World War II. We have diaries from Goebbels. We have diaries from Rosenberg, who wrote down things that Hitler's talk to them about and things like that. And you look at those private conversations that Hitler had, it's very clear he was anti-Christian. I want to talk a little bit about Karl Marx as well, because we're talking about the subject of religion. Both Marx and Hitler hated religion. Hitler today certainly is being dispensed with as having any credibility whatsoever. If you mention Hitler, universally people are going to be against Hitler, except like the white nationalists and so forth. But Karl Marx also hated religion. When I was walking, I take walks every morning and I memorize something. I memorized what Karl Marx said about religion. He said, it's the sigh of the oppressed creature. It's the soul of soulless conditions. It's the opium of the people. And he said, the abolition of religion, therefore, as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their conditions is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. So the criticism of religion is, according to Marx, in embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. So you have both Marx and Hitler as fierce opponents of Christianity, and yet in a lot of modern liberal Christian contexts, Marx is lauded as somewhat heroic. Yeah, Marx saw all religion as being a tool of oppression by the bourgeoisie to try to keep the working class down Uh, Basically, he saw religion as promising the the oppressed people high in the sky by and by so that you can oppress them in the here and now. I mean, that's pretty much the way that he framed it. And so he believed that religion would simply disappear once the oppressive conditions disappeared. So he thought that as a communist society, there wouldn't be any religion because there wouldn't be any need for it, because, again, he thought the need for it was to oppress people. So is it fair to say that Marxism is primarily, and probably the operative word would be primarily, 
about class struggle, Nazism, about racial struggle? Oh, exactly. In fact, Hitler actually used that term at one point. Hitler actually said one time that the difference between Marxism and uh, his own worldview was that Marxism was a class struggle and that he was teaching racial struggle. That's exactly the way Hitler framed it, and, and he's right. And another way to, to think about it, by the way, is that Marx was teaching environmental determinism, specifically that human behavior is determined by the economy, whereas Hitler believed in biological determinism, that is, that he thought that our behavior was determined by our race. So you have this notion of environmental determinism versus biological determinism also, which is a key difference between those two ideologies. I want to know why you are writing about Darwinism, why this is such a focus in your writings. Could it be because people like Dr. Alex Rosenberg are saying that if indeed Darwinism is true, then anything goes? Yeah, Darwinism has immense ramifications for our thinking about who we are as human beings and in thinking about racism. That's just one way. I've also written a good deal about how Darwinism has impacted people's ideas about ethics, about morality. My subtitle of my book, From Darwin to Hitler, is Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism. In fact, the original, when I began that research project for that book, From Darwin to Hitler, that book came out in 2004. But when I began that research project in the mid-1990s, I originally was going to focus on evolutionary ethics in the late 19th century. I wasn't even thinking about Hitler or the Nazis or anything like that. I was thinking about evolutionary ethics, trying to see how these Darwinists in the late 19th century in Germany had been trying to use evolutionary ethics to overthrow Judeo-Christian ethics, as well as Kantian ethics and utilitarian ethics and others. So that was actually my original focus of my research project. But then as I began focusing on evolutionary ethics, I began finding out that a lot of the people promoting evolutionary ethics were also promoting eugenics and euthanasia and scientific racism. And then I started looking at and seeing, this all sounds a lot like Nazi ideology. And so I started making the connection then with Hitler there. So yeah, I mean, these things have ramifications, and not just in Nazi Germany. Yeah, that's one of the most blatant examples of it. But here today, in the 21st century, we have Darwinism impacting debates about euthanasia, assisted suicide. I mean, look at, say, uh, Peter Singer at Princeton University. He's one of the most famous bioethicists in the world today. He's got an endowed chair at Princeton. Singer makes very clear that his embrace of abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia are all built upon a Darwinian foundation. So Darwinism has incredible ramifications for morality, ethics, and religion. Is Singer just an outlier? No, he's not an outlier at all. In fact, uh, there's a, an interesting book written by a colleague, philosophy professor at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He's since passed away. James Rachel's, which is called Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. Uh, and that's an entire book arguing that Darwinism undermines Judeo-Christian morality and the sanctity of life ethic, and that therefore abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia are acceptable. He's not an outlier in the slightest, and in my book, Death of Humanity, in fact, I discuss quite a number of thinkers that have similar kinds of ideas. Again, I'm not saying this is universally held, but still, there are quite a number of thinkers that hold similar views. So how terrifying is that? What are the ramifications? Well, I think it's, uh, obviously, it's dangerous, and that's the way it is with, I think, any uh, anti-Christian philosophy that tries to come along and demote ideas about God, about morality, and Darwinism is a powerful one. I'm not, again, I'm not arguing it's the only one. In fact, my book, Death of Humanity, I bring in a number of other philosophies, like Nietzsche's existentialism, which Nietzsche was in some ways anti-Darwinian, and his philosophy is also frightening. But yeah, Darwinism has a frightening side to it because it, it of what it tells us about we as human beings. Now, when I say that, I know, I understand that there are some people who you know, have some kind of Christian commitment that believe in evolution, and because of their Christian commitment, they still uphold a Christian morality. And I'm thankful for that, that they still uphold that Christian morality. But on the other hand, I think there's some tension and it's at odds with the notions about Darwinism and how it is the source of morality, too. Darwin and the Descent of Man, by the way, did discuss this. This isn't just something that other Darwinists later on came up with. 
Darwin in The Descent of Man talked about how he thought morality had evolved over time to favor those that had certain moral traits and disfavor those who didn't, so the more fit ones would have these moral traits, they'd be more cooperative and such, and that helped them to win the struggle for existence against ones that were less cooperative and things like that. So these ideas about the evolution of morality are something that go back to Darwin himself. But yeah, it's uh, disconcerting to see people trying to tear down uh, Judeo-Christian morality on the basis of evolutionary morality. I think as long as we're talking about evolutionary ethics, we need to mention Richard Dawkins. I don't think it's a coincidence that Dawkins fully approves a scientific experimentation to produce half-human, half-ape hybrids and hopes that these monstrosities will finally convince us as human beings that we're not all that special, that we're merely insignificant pieces of matter in motion. Yeah, and exactly. And Dawkins is, again, not an outlier in that kind of view as well. In fact, all the way back in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were people who were talking about doing artificial insemination experimentation with humans and chimps and such to try to artificially inseminate either a chimp with human sperm or a human with chimp sperm to try to come up with some, you know, creature between humans and apes to try to, again, sort of provide more evidence for evolution, try to break down people's ideas that humans are somehow special. And in fact, Heckel and others fought against what they called anthropocentrism. What they meant by anthropocentrism is the idea that humans are special. Humans have unique status. And that's an idea that we're still seeing in our day quite frequently. Peter Singer is just one example of that. There's a University of Texas ecologist who made some very interesting comments in the early 2000s along those lines, fighting against anthropocentrism. And he actually claimed, this is a guy named Eric Pianca, he actually claimed that it would be good if 90% of the human population were wiped out, because we as humans aren't special and we're ruining the planet. And so you get a lot of people, especially in the animal rights movement and other things like that, who are claiming that humans just aren't special. You know, and so we need to sort of get over that idea. And that idea comes out of the idea that we've just evolved, just like every other creature, and we're just an accidental collection of atoms. What's so disturbing, if I can put it this way, as I read your writings as a historian, is that I'm constantly making parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany and what's happening in our own culture but much more insidiously in the sense that people don't see the logical consequences of the theories that they're embracing. You have a chapter in your book titled Evolutionary Theory in Nazi Schools, and there you see it for its stark, disturbingly nefarious ramifications, where you have a curriculum that says humans disturb natural selection and help the sick and weak. Now, we as Christians think about how important it is to help the sick and the weak. I was just in a leper colony a few weeks ago and saw how Christian missions are providing water and medical assistance for the least of these in Nazi Germany, but also in some modern thought to help the sick and the weak isn't really helpful at all. It's simply retarding the evolutionary process. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly the mentality that was behind the eugenics movement that we've already discussed there. But yes, you're right that helping the weak and sick is considered, you know, helping those who are considered, quote, unfit, who otherwise would perish, and stymieing evolutionary progress. And in fact, what's interesting is that there were quite a number of thinkers, Darwin himself, and also many other Darwinists in the late 19th, early 20th century, who, even though they claimed that morality had evolved, and so morality itself, they thought, didn't have any objectivity about it. On the other hand, they somehow tried to smuggle back in some kind of objectivity by claiming that the evolutionary process itself was what determined what's moral. So whatever advances the biological evolution is good, and whatever, you know, stymies evolutionary progress is bad. 
And so that's where they get the ideas where, you know, that we need to try to eliminate those who are weak and sick. And so the, the way the Nazis did that is they did start off with compulsory sterilization in 1933 to 34. But then they advanced from that in 1939, once the war broke out and they thought they could get away with it, they went ahead and advanced to outright killing of people with disabilities. And so the Nazis, over the course of World War II, killed approximately 200,000 Germans with disabilities because they thought they were unfit. Uh, And so they wanted to get rid of what they called the hereditary taint of those people. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. They murdered some 200,000 disabled Germans, and it wasn't just the Germans. They also murdered tens of thousands of disabled people in occupied territories. Yeah, exactly. In fact, they began the program of extermination of people with disabilities actually began in Poland when they overran Poland. And they began doing it in uh, late 1939 in Poland, but then they shifted the program to Germany itself. But yeah, they they killed disabled people. We don't I don't have the exact statistics, but it was tens of thousands in France, in Poland and in other parts of uh, every place they occupied essentially. As a historian, how do you provide a rationale for Hitler and the Germans saying that they, as Nordic people, were superior to other people. I mean, how did Nordic people get to be superior over other, quote-unquote, races of people? Yeah, interestingly, Nordic racists, and this is before Hitler. By the way, Hitler really didn't have any original ideas, that at least that I know of. Uh, the way that he put them together might have been original, but all the ideas that Hitler had were being put forward by many racist thinkers before him. And there was already a school of Nordic racists before Hitler's time who argued that the Nordic race had become superior because of the environmental conditions that they had had to endure. And so they went through what biologists today would call selection pressure. And so this selection pressure, they thought, was brought about by the harsh climate of the North, because they thought the Nordic people, of course, had evolved in Scandinavia and northern Germany. And so they were talking about the climatic conditions. They also believed the Ice Ages played a role in it, so the ice, the harshness of the Ice Ages, they thought, had made the Nordic peoples more intellectually efficient because they had to think more. They also, they thought, made them more cooperative because they had to work together more to offset these climatic conditions. On the other hand, they thought that the black Africans had been living in tropical climates, and because of that, they thought they didn't need to work very hard. They could just sort of find their food here and there, so they didn't have to, you know, face the strenuous pressures that the Nordic race had. So this was their explanation. The difference in climates uh, had created these different intellectual and moral capacities in these races. Now, what's interesting today is that those same ideas are being recycled by white nationalists. You'll find those exact same ideas on white nationalist websites claiming that the Ice Ages and such had made the Nordic race uh, superior and the black Africans or inferior. I don't want to get too far off topic, but you mentioned climate conditions. Can you weigh in on your perspective on climate change? I mean, there has always been climate change from my perspective. You mentioned Ice Age. I remember reading in Time magazine, in fact, it was a cover story on the looming Ice Age. Now we're talking about warming conditions. Is it true to say or is it superficial to say that climate is always changing and has always changed over time, and there's good substantiation for that. You know, one of the interesting things, and I think, in looking historically at the way that scientists are talking about climate change, especially in relation to the issue that we already raised of eugenics and other kinds of things, is that there seem to be two things that they seem to use to try to motivate people to embrace their particular positions, and that motivates them too. One is extrapolation, and that's a key problem with Darwinism too, by the way. Darwinism thrives on extrapolation. That is, you take small change and you extrapolate it into large change. And that's really the whole basis of Darwinism is extrapolation. And the problem is that if you look at Darwin's origin of species, the things that he extrapolated from, like breeding different pigeon breeds, You cannot extrapolate it indefinitely, but Darwin thought he could. 
Darwin thought he could just extrapolate that breeding process, and it can just go on, you know, those changes can keep just going on and on and on and on to, you know, create new species, new genera, new classes, and all these different new organisms. Well, we now know that that didn't work. Now, later on, scientists came up with new ideas of mutations to try to bridge that gap, but the extrapolation is still a problem for them, and that's a lot of Christian biologists who disbelieve in evolution today argue that microevolution does make a lot of sense, but macroevolution doesn't, and that's the problem with Darwin. They're extrapolating from the micro to the macro. The same problem of extrapolation comes in with eugenics movement. They were looking at some of these trends, these reproductive trends, and they started getting scared because they thought, oh, no, these people are out reproducing us, and we're going to have this problem. Well, they extrapolated from small sample sets. And the same thing, I think, is happening with the climate change thing, too. There's this problem of extrapolation, which, you know, uh, can be tricky. And that's, I think, going to be one of the things that we're going to have to see if it really does pan out, if you can really extrapolate from this small set to something larger. The other key issue that I think is both, characteristic within the eugenics movement and the climate change movement is this fear factor. There's tremendous fear that's being generated. And one of the problems that I have with climate change, and I don't want to get too far on this, it's kind of off topic here, but one of the problems that I have with the climate change issue is that even if it is true that the climate keeps on increasing in temperature, there are both good and bad things that could be possible consequences of those. But you never hear anyone talk about the good consequences that could come about by global warming. You always hear the negative consequences. And by the way, anything proves it. If you have a drought or if you have floods, it doesn't matter. It's all, you know, it's all a consequence of global warming. So anything that happens, they can claim is a consequence. Anything bad that happens, I should say, they'll claim is a consequence of global warming. Anything good that happens, they won't talk about that. Well, this is a little off point as well, but you are well-versed in so many different areas. I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Again, I'm a little bit sensitive about all of this, having come back from a country where there are somewhere around 1.3, 1.4 billion people, and so many of them do not have fresh water, where we're spending tens of trillions of dollars of the global economy on a phantom problem or something that might at least be phantom to some extent, yeah. where with, I forget the exact number, the number 200 billion sticks in my mind. For 200 billion, we could provide fresh water for everyone on the planet that doesn't have it presently. So instead of fighting a phantom problem, we could be taking care of the real needs of people. And I mean, I've seen it firsthand where women particularly in the caste system, you have the outcasts or the deletes, they can't drink from the water of people in the caste system. And so they just don't have fresh water. They're drinking polluted water. We could be providing fresh water for them instead of fighting phantom problems. Yeah. And even if the problem isn't a phantom problem, I think one of the problems with this whole discourse is that people become so fixated on one problem at a time. And I don't know if, I think the media just sort of operates this way too. The media sort of tends to focus our attention on one thing. And we get so fixated on that one thing that we forget about everything else. And even if it is a real problem, we get so fixated on that one problem that we end up with all sorts of solutions that might even be worse than the problem itself. And so, you know, some of the solutions we have to global warming might actually be worse than global warming. So we need to be very careful, I think, in that respect. What about the moniker, follow the science? We hear that all the time now. And as I mentioned in the prologue to this podcast, anyone who has spent even a modicum of time looking at the progression of scientific speculation knows that academics or scientists are not impervious to groupthink. You got tenure, you got social dynamics, you got grants, you have so many different factors that are in play. And so you have this herd mentality, and you've ably pointed out the herd mentality when it comes to eugenics, but we have that all over the place, and we have to be very careful with that moniker, follow the science. It sounds reasonable, but in many cases, it isn't reasonable at all. No, it isn't. And if you look at the history of science, 
you see again and again and again places where scientists were incredibly wrong, like in the racism issue, you know, so-called scientific racism. Back in the 1890s, early 1900s, scientists were insisting that racism was scientific. And if you question that, they sometimes, and I've actually seen this, they have criticized people who were anti-racist, saying, you're letting your religion get in the way. You know, you're letting these egalitarian ideas from your religion, you know, color your thinking, but science teaches us, you know, that races are different and that they have different intellectual capacities, and then they go on and on. So, yeah, if you look at the history of science, you see all sorts of episodes of this, and that's just one that I've just given you, scientific races. Interestingly, however, we tend to have this hubris about us as an intellectual elite that scientists today will say, well, that was then. <laughs> you know, that was back in the day. We, you know, we've overcome those ideas. You know, we now have better, new, improved ideas about all these things. And so we can recognize these things in the past, but a lot of times people don't want to recognize in the present. And so, as you're suggesting, there are many things in the present that scientists believe part of the consensus, so they think they have to believe it, and they, many of them do, but they don't even question it. They don't even think about it, and if you dare to question it, they will automatically say, oh, your religion is getting in the way, you know, you know you're, you're not thinking about things scientifically here or whatever. And so, yeah, the scientists very often get caught up in these ideas. And the closer, by the way, that you get to dealing with who we are as humans, the bigger a problem that is for science. And the sciences of psychology and sociology, if they can be called sciences, they are now undergoing what some people are referring to as a replication crisis. And what the replication crisis means is that some of these sort of textbook examples of psychological experiments that for years psychologists were teaching to their students at the universities, they're trying to replicate those experiments and failing. And we're not just talking about one or two things. We're talking about dozens and dozens of experiments that were considered to be, you know, the truth. And now scientists are recognizing that there are problems with them. Uh, And so this is becoming a big problem in the social sciences uh, especially. So, again, the closer you get to humans and things that impact humans, the bigger problem this becomes in the sciences because... We have more prejudices and biases and such, and our worldview affects those things to a greater degree. We were talking earlier about sterilization. I want to talk about transgenderism for just a moment, because effectively what is happening with a lot of people is they're being sterilized, as it were, that their metaphysics are determining their physics. In other words, instead of the other way around, where we're looking at biological sex, we're allowing our perceptions of gender to determine whether we're male or female. And as a result of that metaphysical determination, we're making drastic physical decisions that cannot be reversed. Yeah, and that can be very tragic. And in fact, since this has become the rage in the past a decade especially or so, we're also now seeing some of the consequences of that, which is people are recognizing that this didn't help them. <laughs> Even if you were able to do it, people are recognizing that that didn't help them, and now there are people detransitioning, that is going back to their original sex. But unfortunately, those who have gone through the chemical and surgical alterations now are left scarred for life. But, you know, I think the issue here, I mean, about transgenderism gets at the issue of, you know, we want to be as God. You know, we want to control everything. We don't want to be told what we are and who we are, and so we don't want to be content with how God made us. And unfortunately, some of this gets bred again in young children as they, you know, interact with peers. And, you know, I can understand why some get confused over things because they want to fit in, they want to, you know, be popular, they want all these different things, and there's a lot of pressures going on in their lives, and they think somehow that's going to be a silver bullet to, you know, if I get this change, then somehow I'll be popular, I'll be fit more with what I want to be, and then they find out it doesn't work that way. 
And you see just how important the Christian worldview is, because in the Christian worldview, the soul is engendered. Right. So the problem here is we're decoupling biological sex from gender. Right. And that is a huge, huge problem. Christianity has the answer. The evolutionary hypothesis does not. I want to get back to the main and the plain that we've been talking about, and that is to get your perspective on what hard heredity is and why it is important in the debate about whether the Nazis embraced evolutionary theory. Yeah, hard heredity is the idea that biological inheritance is passed on through DNA, well, Nazi didn't know about DNA, but they knew that the hereditary traits were passed on biologically and such, rather than there being what's called soft heredity, which is where you know you could have you know environmental things shaping them uh, as well. So the Nazis were biological racists, biological determinists, and believed that biology really was the determining factor that you couldn't change people's nature, and, and in fact, because of that. This is why when they tried to target the Jews as they considered an inferior race, and they tried to target them, they didn't target them based on what religion they practiced, because Hitler didn't care what a person's religion was. What he cared about was their racial characteristics. And so they looked at the grandparents of the person to try to determine whether or not they were a Jew, not looking at themselves, because they thought if their grandparents are Jews, then they're Jews. That's basically the idea. So the idea is that they were looking at heredity to determine the value of the individuals. And so if a Jew, for example, had become an atheist or an agnostic or had converted to Catholicism or converted to Protestantism, Hitler didn't care. They still got sent to Auschwitz or Treblinka or other death camps because they were identified as Jewish. It didn't matter what they believed. It mattered what their biological makeup was. You've already sort of touched on this, but I think it's worthy of expansion. The Nazis thought that Darwinian evolutionary theory provided a scientific and intellectual foundation for Nazism. So my question is, why is it that so many evangelicals today think that the evolutionary theory is compatible with Christianity? Yeah, I mean, I, my sense of the matter is thinking historically about how the history and sort of the psychology of people in these kind of matters is, I think a lot, in a lot of cases, it's simply people are wanting to fit in with what they see as the dominant intellectual scientific worldview, and they, for one reason or other, perhaps they are taught it in school, and so they believe it through their schooling, or they you know, get confronted, maybe they grew up disbelieving it and get to college, and then they can't answer the questions of the the professor that teaches them evolution, so they feel kind of stupid, and so they don't want to feel stupid. So they want to feel like they are part of the sort of enlightened intellectual elites, and they see that as a path to that. So I think social pressure and acceptance probably does play a very big role in all of this, as it does in many things in our lives, not just with evolution, but I think in a lot of other of our beliefs as well. But I think that there's a lot of cases where Christians don't want to feel ostracized by society, and so they see this as a way of fitting in better with society. And to be fair, I think some of them believe that once you believe that, if you come to a belief that evolution is true, then Many of them think that those that reject evolution are sort of turning off people to the truth of Christianity by rejecting it, and that they, by embracing evolution, can then reach those people who believe evolution, too. Do you ever think that this might be a case of buying high and selling low, that there's going to be a point in our history where we look back at Darwinian evolution and say, how in the world could anyone have contended for such a absolutely bankrupt idea? Yeah, well, I hope we'll dispense with it fairly quickly, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. It's going to depend a lot on where people go with the larger worldviews, because if you are going to continue to embrace a worldview in which there is no God, I mean, even pre-Darwinian, there were people, of course, who embraced materialistic worldviews before Darwin came on the scene. So if you're going to continue to embrace that kind of a worldview, evolution almost has to be true, you know, some kind of evolution. So it's like sort of the default position for atheism and a lot of forms of agnosticism and such. So 
I think it's going to depend on where we go with our response to God and the gospel. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true, but I'm thinking about it from within the parameters of the broad Christian worldview. I mean, it just isn't compatible. No, I don't think so at all. And there's huge issues relating to compatibility. And I was talking, in fact, with a biology teacher not too long ago who claims to be a Christian and who also embraced evolution. And he himself was telling me that he thought that Christianity had a big problem in dealing with evolution because of the issue of sin and death and other kinds of issues like that, that both evolution and Christianity have answers to, but not the same answers. So he himself was saying that he thought there were tensions between Christianity and evolution, so I asked him how he reconciled those, and he just sort of threw up his hands and said, I don't know. I want to talk about Chapter 8 of your book, Darwinism and Neo-Nazism and White Nationalism. The white nationalists hold contempt for the U.S. Declaration of Independence because of its dictum primarily that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. Instead, they believe that might is right. They believe that the destruction of feeble types is not only natural but necessary. A typical mission statement, and I think I got this from your book. I wrote this down. A typical mission statement for the white nationalists might be, cursed are the unfit, for they shall be righteously exterminated. And when I read that, I thought immediately of what Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and that was a very direct play, obviously, upon that, in trying to counter that. In fact, I don't remember if that came out of Ragnar Redbeard's book, Might is Right, but it wouldn't surprise me if it did. But in any case, Ragnar Redbeard in 1896, and that's a pseudonym, by the way, we don't know exactly who this was, wrote a book called Might is Right. And in that book, which is, by the way, available in PDF on a lot of white nationalist websites or being sold on white nationalist websites and such today, it is still being recommended by a lot of white nationalists. His subtitle of the book was Survival of the Fittest, and he promoted social Darwinist ideas an idea similar to the one that you just quoted. In fact, it might have been a quote from his book. I don't remember off the top of my head. But interestingly, that book, Might is Right, was recommended by the young man who committed a mass shooting at the Gilroy Garlic Festival in 2019. Just before he went and shot up the Garlic Festival, he put on his social media that everyone ought to read Redbeard's book, Might is Right. And so that book has been circulated quite extensively among white nationalists. And now here's another interesting thing about that book, Might is Right. The book actually had fallen into really relative obscurity until the 1970s when Anton LaVey, the leader of the Satanic Church, publicized it in his Satanic Bible. And that's really where it (laughs) sort of took off and began to influence a lot of white nationalists since then. You make the point that the white nationalist agenda is a logical deduction of Darwin's famous pronouncement. If man is to advance still higher, he must remain subject to a severe struggle. Otherwise, he would sink into indolence, and the more gifted men would not be more successful than the less gifted men. That, by the way, coming directly from the descent of man. Yeah, and when I was doing my work on this book, Darwinian Racism, I did a good deal of research on white nationalist websites and publications, and I hope the FBI doesn't look at my my record of my readings. But anyway, it was legitimate research that I was doing on it. What I found was that Darwin was lauded. Generally, Christianity was condemned on most of the white nationalist websites, but they not only uh, thought highly of Darwin, but they believed that Darwinism was proof for their white nationalist views. If you look at the writings of the psychologist Kevin McDonald, he was a professor at California State University, Long Beach. He was very anti-Semitic. He promoted evolutionary psychology, and he saw that as the basis for white nationalism. Richard Spencer, who was a pretty prominent figure in the so-called alt-right movement, got a little more press around 2016, 2017, so not quite as well-known today. 
But still, he's one of the key figures that was known as the alt-right leader, and he wrote in some of his blogs, group differences exist as consequences of evolution by natural selection. And then he said that racial differences are a natural and normal consequence of human evolution. So again, they're drawing these conclusions from Darwin's theory that Darwin himself drew, that races are different because of their evolutionary past. And this is uh, then a position that is resurfacing now, albeit it's, of course, among a fringe group today, not among the mainstream scientists and such today, but there are those out there that are embracing this view. This is sort of mainstream cosmotheism, seeing nature as your God and promoting evolution as God's highest command. Yeah, it is. And some of these people do tend more toward pantheistic kind of view, and that's, in, in fact, a uh, view similar to Hitler's own. In fact, when my book, Hitler's Religion, came out, I actually got an email from a neo-Nazi who told me that he thought that I had interpreted Hitler exactly right, that Hitler was a pantheist. And he agreed with that, and he himself apparently likes pantheism as well. So, yeah, there's neo-Nazis and white nationalists today who are embracing pantheistic worldview as well. One of the conclusions you draw in your book is that there are some parallels between what happened in the 20th century and what's happening in the 21st century. The irony, when you have a Nobel Prize winning biologist like James Watson suggesting that some racial groups such as black Africans had lower intelligence because of their evolutionary history. And you point out that when this was said in 2007, there was a lot of criticism, but that criticism may be waning in the evolutionary psychological science with Harvard's Steven Pinker on its editorial board. You have an article defending the anti-Semitic racist views of Kevin McDonald, an emeritus professor of psychology at California State University, Long Beach. So on the one hand, you have the statement that seems outrageous, but the edifice of outrage seems to be cracking a little bit. Yeah, it's hard to tell where that's going to go from here. I mean, still, the mainstream does seem to be anti-racist, and I'm thankful for that. But it's hard to know where this is going to go in the future with the intellectual tides. Jerry Cohn, another professor of evolutionary biology, argues that infanticide and assisted suicide should be permitted and insists that the increasing acceptance of these horrors in our society, although he doesn't call them horrors, is a sign of moral progress. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty uh, common view. Steven Pinker also, by the way, takes the view that we're progressing morally, and they have these, you know, progressive views. But it's, by the way, it's interesting that if you look at their views of morality, like Coin, for example, he believes that it evolved, so he doesn't think there is any objective morality. And yet, what are we progressing toward then? How can you have progress if there's no objective morality? Progress implies that there's some objective moral yardstick outside of ourselves. So if you claim we're making moral progress, then you have to believe in some kind of objective morality, which most of these people claim they don't believe in. They claim they don't believe in any kind of objective morality. They think it's just an evolved trait that we're wrestling with. But if you look at, like, Jerry Coyne, for example, in when he talked about the fact that we should allow people to do assisted suicide, because he, one of the things he said is, well... We euthanize dogs, you know, we have compassion on a dog and we, you know, euthanize it rather than letting it suffer and such. But if I told Jerry Coyne, well, look, Jerry, how about this? How about if we round up all of the homeless people in New York City and we will incarcerate them and we will sterilize them? And then if we can't find homes for them with someone to take them in, then we will euthanize them. I can guarantee you that Jerry Coyne would <laughs> would not agree to that, that he would say that this is immoral and, and horrible, and how could I even entertain such an idea? But what I just described to you is exactly what we do to dogs. So somehow Jerry Coyne knows there's a difference between dogs and humans, even though he will not admit it himself. One time he said that we have no more extrinsic purpose than an armadillo. But I think Jerry Coyne knows better than that. 
I want to talk a little bit as we end this podcast about the death of humanity. First of all, the title is arresting, the death of humanity, the subtitle, and the case for life. Weigh in on the connection between our abandonment of God and then discarding humanity. The consequences of the view that we're just meaningless blobs of protein. Yeah, well, interestingly, once we abandon the idea that there is a God, if intellectual elites, and many of them have, got rid of that idea, then there's nothing to support the idea that humans have any value any longer. Now, fortunately, most people in their consciences and deep down know that that's not true, and so they don't act upon that, but that's what they're denying overtly. So one of the cases that I came across that was very interesting when I was researching the death of humanity was Bertrand Russell, the early 20th century British philosopher, one of the most famous British philosophers of the 20th century, who overtly denied that humans have any kind of purpose or meaning in life. He said that we are an accidental collocation of atoms. What a great turn of phrase there. You know, we're a cosmic accident, essentially. And he's not the only one saying that. I mean, Friedrich Nietzsche obviously is teaching a similar kind of thing, that, you know, that humans have no cosmic purpose, meaning, uh, significance beyond ourselves. We just create it ourselves. Morality is just something we create of ourselves. And so when they abandon God, they recognize that they abandon humanity as well. In fact, Foucault, who was one of the most famous French philosophers of the late 20th century, Foucault actually said quite forthrightly that once you've abandoned God, then you also are denying humanity. But he thought that was good. He wanted to deny God and deny humanity as well. By the way, he sort of spoke out of both sides of his mouth, though, because he talked a lot about human rights, even though he didn't believe in human rights. He didn't believe there were any intrinsic or objective human rights, but he would talk about human rights if it served his purposes of pushing his political position and such. So I think deep down, a lot of these people, even though they deny God, they recognize there's something about humanity that's special, but they don't admit it to themselves. And I mentioned to Bertrand Russell just a little bit ago, Bertrand Russell, when he wrote a letter to a woman that he was in love with, made some really powerful statements about how he said that this search for transcendence and such was gave his life meaning, even though he didn't believe there was anything transcendent. So intellectually, he denied there's anything transcendent. On the other hand, he said that he still was searching for something transcendent, and that he somehow has this notion that something does exist beyond himself, but he can't bring himself to intellectually accept that. I want to end with a delicious quote in your book. It's on page 281 of The Death of Humanity, where you write, noted 20th century Christian journalist and intellectual Malcolm Muggeridge, recognized the connection between abandoning God and discarding humanity when he wrote... If there was no God, nor any transcendental purpose in the experience of living in this world, then a human being's life would be no more intrinsically sacred than is that of a boiler house chicken when it stops laying eggs or is otherwise incapacitated, no longer rates its allowance of chicken feed, and has its neck wrung. And then you say, unfortunately, some secularists agree with Muggeridge, and the problem is they draw the exact opposite conclusion. They confirm his fear by biting the bullet and degrading humans, acquitting them with chickens, and that is precisely what organizations like PETA does. Yeah, and, you know, I've talked with people, not very many, a few, One I can think of in 2009, I was at a conference about Darwinism, and I talked to a philosophy graduate student, and he was telling me he believed in evolutionary ethics, and so I asked him the Hitler question. I said, you know, since I do a lot of research about Hitler, I said, well, what about Hitler? I said, are you telling me that Hitler was neither right nor wrong, that what he did was not objectively immoral or anything? And he said, yeah, what Hitler did was neither right nor wrong. And I said, well, how do you deal with that? And he sort of hemmed and hawed and said, well, I don't like what Hitler did, but objectively, there's nothing wrong with it. So, yeah, that's where we're at as a culture, unfortunately, among some of our intellectual elites. I'm hoping that we can retake our culture, though, to where people will, I mean, deep down, they recognize that's not true, but intellectually, they try to promote that idea. 
Well, I deeply appreciate you and your writings. The book, Darwinian Racism, How Darwinism Influenced Hitler, Nazism, and White Nationalism. By the way, you can get that book through the Christian Research Institute. You can find it on the web at equip.org. Also, a book that, as I confessed, I haven't finished reading, but I'll probably be up all night reading it tonight, The Death of Humanity. It is a compelling book from what I have read, the subtitle, and the case for life. So it's the death of humanity and the case for life. Both books available to the Christian Research Institute. If you stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. As always, we are committed on Hank Unplugged to bring the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And certainly Dr. Richard Weichart is squarely in the center of our mission statement. Again, Dr. Weichardt, thank you so much for your insights, for your writing, for your stand for the Christian worldview. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been great talking to you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Hank Unplugged podcast. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast. So long for now.